start with the take home messages, messages in case you know you can just take it and then you can you've got a dinner date or something on. Um, <laughs> Uh, in case you, <laughs> in case you're in the wrong room, um, uh, and I will also try and weave in some of my experience of how I got to where I am in terms of this topic area because it's not the most, it wasn't the most obvious um, <laughs> of journeys, and certainly not one I was planning in the traditional sense of that word. Um, so just a little bit of a. Of a, of a background, I did, we didn't have a Students for Global Health type society when I was in med school, but I did, uh, of the first year of the um, intercalated BSc in International Health at UCL. So we were the guinea pigs of, um, of, that, uh, of that endeavor. And I think for me, that was one of my first real exposures to public health in the sense of the scope uh, and the scale of potential intervention for population health. Because who are the medics in the room? Are you still getting taught public health in medical school? Is it still really terrible? <laughs> um, my experience actually was not particularly, it was kind of somewhat dry and I didn't really see the relevance and I, it was never something I thought I would do. I did the, in the BSc because it appealed to me in terms of the scale of impact. I thought, wow, this is something interesting, something we're not taught, and you know, let's see how it is. And one of one of the great things, um, one of the great things I got from that was a sense of community in terms of uh, meeting like-minded medical students who really were driven by that um, desire to do something bigger. And so I really, I wouldn't underestimate the value of this kind of association just to pick you up when you're feeling like, when you're getting input like, but this is not what you're supposed to be doing. You know, it's really important to get that. So I actually spent most of my research um, time. So I, I, uh, I did, I trained in internal medicine um, and then ended up in HIV because I did my BSc thesis on antiretroviral therapy um, because it was uh, it was the years so it was ooh, I want to date myself in this room, here <laughs> some people. It was 2000, and it was when uh, the, the Médecins Sans Frontières were piloting access to antiretroviral therapy in low and middle income areas. And fun fact, the title of my thesis was, but they have no watches, because it was a quote from the head of UNAIDS at the time who said, well, you can't provide antiretroviral therapy in poor places because they have no watches. If they can't tell the time, if they can't tell the time, how will they know when to take the ARVs? So my thesis was looking at, um, so this is not what you came for, is it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, was looking at uh, the first uh, data looking at adherence to um, ARVs in the first six to 12 months of those pilot projects around the world. One of them was in South Africa, so I got interested in that. And fast forward a few years, ended up going in, uh, working, working clinically in HIV in London, and then going to do research in HIV in South Africa for 12 months, and stayed for 11 years. <laughs> Okay, we'll pick, pick, pick up on that at some point. Remind me, if you're getting bored, just say, go back to the story. Um, okay, so take home messages. One, beware of the averages hiding the sins of inequities, right? Secondly, when I talk about NCD policy, I'm not just talking about, and we shouldn't just be talking about health policy in the traditional sense. The third is really to achieve the NTD, the targets that we've set for ourselves globally, we're going to need to do much more than efforts within the healthcare sector alone, and will require collective multisectoral efforts. And lastly, because this is on NTD policy, you can't influence policy if you don't know the policy. Right. And I think this is one of the biggest um, sources of hubris 
particularly amongst medics, but general just health professionals, it's like, well, and researchers as well, you know, we have the answers, why is no one listening to us, but we don't actually take the time to get a sense of what we're trying to influence. So those are the four key things, and each of those, I could do a... I could do a separate lecture on each of those, so I was, it was very difficult to decide what to, whether to focus on one of those or to try and bring uh, little bits, snippets of each of those, and so that's what I went for. What you won't learn is anything around the management of NCDs. That's, not, that's just not what I'm going to talk about at all. Maybe we should leave the door open in case if you want to sneak out <laughs> The other thing I'm not focusing on is any detailed epi in terms of numbers um, and anything you can find online because you know what, you know, your own literature review. <laughs> I'm not doing your homework for you. Um, so what instead I want to do is use some of these take-home points just to reflect on some of um, my, exper uh, my experiences and then we can hopefully not talk for very long and then we can get into a little bit of a, of a discussion. So in terms of the NCD trends, you think, well, how did I end up in NCD, given that I just stopped the story at HIV? Well, I did for a few years. In fact, my doctoral work was on uh, the co-infection of HIV TB, so the clinical epidemiology of HIV TB, because no sooner had I arrived in South Africa did I realize you can't really look at HIV without looking at TB, because in that context, um, over two-thirds of TB patients are co-infected with HIV, and they're really one and the same epidemic, syndemic in that way. So I did that for a while, and then I realized I was also doing some clinical work, so at that point, so in the TB, largely in the TB clinic, but also a little bit in the, just the primary care clinic. Um, and I started realizing that, yes, this is a really, um, really important systemic of HIV TB, the rollout of ARVs, so this was 2007 when I went to South Africa, the rollout of ARVs were in full swing, certainly in Cape Town, really control of HIV was um, at a population level fairly, fairly good and improving. But I also started noticing anecdotally at the clinic that, you know, you have people come in for the HIV, um, treatment regularly, you know, religiously there, viral load, suppressed, excellent, everyone's high-fiving themselves, but we were still seeing premature mortality, why? You'd have a 40-year-old come in with a stroke from undiagnosed hypertension who had excellently controlled HIV and was being seen every, every month. And I thought, well, are we trying to treat diseases? Are we trying to treat people? Because what point, it, what point, what good is it if we, we're saying, well, HIV is very well controlled, but we're leaving wide open the risk for um, uh, other sources of morbidity and mortality? So I started wondering, well, how big a problem is this in this context? Because obviously, we know that South Africa was in the midst of some um, epidemiological transition, but you're kind of in the HIV TB world, you think, well, that is somewhere else, because you know, if you have HIV or TB, that's, that's all you can, you can get, apparently. So, um, so I started looking at that, and that's when I started realizing that beyond just the HIV TB, we had this really um, iceberg of non clinical disease epidemic that was, did not have the same profile or funding, or advocacy, even as HIV or TB. Okay, we'll come back to that. This is one of like two epi things. <laughs> Having said that you wouldn't learn any epi, this is, honestly, I'm not really even going to talk through. Uh, suffice to say that <coughs> when we talk about NCDs uh, today, we're largely focusing on the four big NCDs, so that's cardiovascular disease, cancer, chronic respiratory, and diabetes. Most of my work is on the cardiometabolic, so the, the diabetes and cardiovascular uh, spectrum, so the, the results of some of the work I'll share with you is focused on that. But, um, and the reason why is because really by vastly uh, the majority of, of NCD deaths 
are due to these four conditions. And so at a global uh, macro level, you can see huge um, variation, certainly as a, as a country level, in the burden of the mortality um, from, from, from those NCDs. By the way, is, is everyone in the room familiar with the, uh, should come on to next, the Global Burden of Disease um, Studies? Um, there's a lot of critique and they're not perfect by any means, but it's a really great way of delving in to a, the subnational level um, on particular issues in, in, in a particular given setting. Let's start with England. What are your thoughts on this? So this is the years of, years of life lost due to disability. Is that something that, um, is that terminology familiar with everyone in the room? Is anyone not familiar with that? Okay. So when we talk about, um, particularly around NCDs, because they're chronic, uh, long, um, long time arcs, uh, mortality, which is death rate, is one of the, one of the measures of, of disease burden we look at. But importantly, another is morbidity. So how much of, which is, so the most common, certainly in the GBD context, is used as a disability adjusted life years, which is a combination of years of life, pre prematurely years of life lost, and years of life lived with disability. And that's important because that may not pick up in the mortality, but you're still not healthy, right? Because you have a deficit in terms of how far away you are from optimal health. So when I talk about years of life lost, um, years of life uh, with disability, this is uh, one of the terms uh, related to morbidity. So any thoughts on this? What strikes? What jumps out at you? So low back and neck pain is really high. <laughs> Isn't it just? <clears throat> Any other thoughts? Increase in diabetes. Increase in diabetes, yeah. And that falls are actually above diabetes. Hmm. How do you think that is? Why that is? Sorry? Why that is? Yeah, yeah. yeah. What would you think? <laughs> the, what's the demography of the country? Apart from diabetes, um, not a huge change um, across those that time arc. Like, Medication headaches. Sorry. Medication headaches. Yeah. What is that about? <laughs> you can pray for angina that could cause headache, and so if heart problem increased, then this might increase. It could do. What's another reason that you always have to consider when you see things that you're not uh, sure about? Or you're not expecting? Changes in the way it's measured? Yeah. <laughs> Over between 1990 and 2013, you've just got to go back and see, well, have they started measuring it a bit better? Have they characterized it a bit differently? I don't know the answer, but just... Uh, something to always consider, especially when comparing data over a long period of time. But by and large, NCD, right? So it's just a sea of blue. When we come to the uh, risk factors, um, the common risk factors for the NCDs, this is again England, this is in 20, comparing 1990 again to 2013. What are, what are your thoughts here? I kind of thought smoking might be number one, but it's a bit further down than I thought. Mm. Not only is it further down, but it's gone down. Body mass index and vitamin blood glucose have gone up quite a bit. Yeah. Right? It's pretty striking. Is that surprising? Why are you pessimist? 
It's, it's an issue of recording. Um, between 19... Well, I'm an old man, so I know this. <laughs> between 1919 and 2013, every general practitioner had to record and submit the, these parameters on all their patients. Mm -hmm. for, mm -hmm. um, and they got paid for doing it. Right. Um, and therefore, there was more data in the system, especially yes. around body mass index, yes. glucose. I don't know if well, that's the uh, yeah, iron deficiency, I'm not yes. sure, high blood pressure, smoking, they all had to be recorded in alcohol. So it's interesting where when, when you see results that you're surprised by, you question them, but when you see results that you're not surprised by, you're like, oh yeah, oh yeah, that's just how the data comes in. Don't forget to be critical, even of the what you expect, something that uh, affirms your belief, right? Okay, so just, um, we'll pick up on the, the BMI and, and glucose um, again, you know, in this one. This is the last, this is the last um, UK, England rather. So this is a, it's a heat map, essentially. You don't need to be able to read it, right? Without, before we even talk about the axes, if you just look over here, what, what can you deduce? What patterns can you see? Just very literally. Cross your eyes, even if you need to. Sorry? There's a lot of variation between different areas. There's a lot of variation. Do you can you see any pattern, or is it is it all scattered? <laughs> no, but let's just talk about this first. So there's lots of variation, but if you cross your eyes, do you see any pattern in the variation? It kind of moves from a lot of green to a lot of red. Okay. So that's the first, that's the first thing that should jump out at you before you go in. Just don't dismiss that knee jerk. You saw it, but you didn't necessarily register it. So along the lines here with some of the different um, uh, um, morbidities, so diseases and conditions. So from ischemic heart disease, so going from left to right, lung cancer, COPD, etc. From top down, is from deprivation level five, which is good. Deprivation level one, which is bad. So now what is the pattern, obvious pattern that you see? Right. But it's the same, the same country, same people, why is it? And if you look at the middle, Obviously, it's pegged to the middle, so that's why it's all yellow in the middle, right? So this is above, above, um, lower than the mean, so less, less burden than the mean and higher burden than the mean. So obviously, the mean is all yellow. So the point I want you to take home from this is that if we just looked at England, like we talk about South Africa, or we talk about Canada, or we talk about Australia or New Zealand, and this is the line we're talking about. What it doesn't tell us is what is, what is inside. And so when, we, when you start thinking about NCD, NCD approaches to NCD prevention and approaches to NCD management, it's important that we're cognizant that we're not saying, okay, this is the policy for England. Let's do it this way. Because in the context of limited resources and... Um, competing priorities, do we just say we need to roll out this intervention across the country? Um, this, this is South Africa, so there's a country, and these are the different uh, provinces um, of the country, so there are nine, nine provinces. What do you see? Quite similar. Among the, quite similar among the provinces. Right, right. So by and large, there is certainly the bits down there, the blue bits of blue but across the board, some smatterings, but more similar than the previous. Yeah. Somebody said something. This is the colour of blue. So, 
yeah so these are the ranking uh, rankings of the risk of the contributions of these risk factors to overall morbidity so childhood undernutrition is hot across the board because it is the top in 1990 uh, risk factor contributing to disability adjusted life years the top five are completely different from England mm. in 1990. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. A lot to do with nutrition, hygiene, and sanitation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Let's fast forward to 2015. What do we see now? Same. Chronic profile. Yeah. Chronic yeah. profile. Looks more like England. Right? Yeah. Mm. High body mass index, less than size. Less than size. Less than size. Less than size. Although I do have a separate lecture on epidemiological transition and the fallacy of it, but I will, I'll spare you about that. Now. Obviously, unsafe sex is top because, right, because it spanned the hump of the, because 1990 was pre the peak of the, of the epidemic in South Africa. But huge um, increase in high body mass index, glucose, blood pressure. It wouldn't look exactly this way, by the way, if we remember this is morbidity. morbidity. Mortality hides a lot, of, a lot of that to some extent because mortality favors more acute and more infectious conditions. So you often don't see, it doesn't feature here, but um, mental ill health, huge um, contributor to to morbidity, violence, injuries, and violence. Okay. But interesting that um, at the when you break it down into the different uh, provinces, it doesn't appear to have as much variation as um, as in the UK. What I won't show you is that so Western Cape. Is where, um, is where Cape Town, so the province of Cape Town. Um, I didn't put it on, I knew I should have put it on, but um, maps to show within Cape Town the variation in this. So even though this is disaggregated to the level of the province, it hides a lot of inequity within each of these provinces. If we look again, looking a different way, and this is more now focused on the conditions themselves. The, the text is hard to read, so a shortcut. Blue is NCDs, red is infectious, green is injury and violence. Anything above the zero line has gone up between 1990 and 2010. Anything below the zero line has gone down. So again, without reading, what can you see? A lot of NCDs have gone up. And anything in the room. So when I started worrying about um, the way that w the kind of narrow focus of, of my research on HIV TB, this is not narrow because it's quite a huge uh, um, epidemic, I started wondering about. Um, so we see a huge amount of HIV here, and, but still are keep ex coexisting with a lot of NCD. I started wondering, well, Yes, this is occurring within the same country. And traditionally, we think about NCDs as, you know, as you develop, you increase, you know, the Omran, Omran theory of epidemiological transition. You know, you kind of develop, and then you get kind of slower and fatter, and then you develop NCDs, right? So surely it's different people because, you know, HIV, TB, 
So I started wondering amongst the people that I was seeing uh, what the patterns of comorbidity was. So the first thing I did was look just within, so recognizing that we know there's a lot of undiagnosed disease, particularly NCDs because it can be, it can not show for a long time. Okay? I thought, well, let's just look amongst people who are in attending pr the primary care clinic, so who are already receiving treatment. Because, so I worked in Kailicha and Site B, um, uh, so Kailicha is the largest informal mixed formality um, um, neighborhood in, in, south, in Cape Town and maybe the second largest in South Africa. And within that there's this, this big primary care clinic and you, you drive in, there's a gate, and on the right is a big car park in the middle, and on the right is the HIV TB clinic. Um, which basically MSF squatted because, <laughs> and then became a, became a, a government facility afterwards. But I mean, I think you know the history that MSF would start providing antiretroviral therapy while the government was still in denial about um, causes of HIV. But the other side of the car park is the primary care, so the general outpatients and the A and E. Right. So. You have um, diabetes, and you've had it for a long time. You come into the, into the compound, you go left, you go to the reception there, you pick up your folder with your particular unique folder number and you go in and you get seen that way. And then one day you start coughing and you wonder whether there's something there and you worry about TB. So you come in and you go right and you have a totally different folder with a, that's not connected to that one. The person that's seeing you there is not asking you about your diabetes because they don't know because you're here for TB and that's and it's a TB place. Mm -hmm. So what we ended up with um, to a large extent is still the case although it's changing. It's this very siloed health system that was really very vertical and very disease oriented and split into this <laughs> chronic infectious, which is kind of HIV TB, and chronic non-communicable and everything else in there. So sitting in the HIV TB clinic is very difficult for me to figure out. I couldn't just look at our patient folders to say, well, how many people have diabetes, who's been treated for, because they were in a different folder, in the same, um, across the way, right? Different pharmacies, different, <coughs> etc. So. So we did a study um, to look at, essentially, over a nine-month period, all the patients that were being seen for one of four conditions, for HIV, for TB, for diabetes, and for hypertension. Um, this wasn't in Site B, this was in another clinic in Kailicha. We did that just using the electronic prescription records because we have that, um, but they were separate. Um, the, the folders were separate, even though each patient has a unique patient identifier, right? You follow me? So we're able to link um, records with patients that were not linked on the ground. So if I say that we found that um, of the four, so this is just, remembering this is just the tip of the iceberg, this is amongst people who are already being seen, being treated for one of those four conditions. If I say that one, that, that almost a quarter of people had a second comorbidity, and if I said, um, so that was in eight, amongst HIV patients, what would be the comorbidity that you'd get? Based on what I've just said about the pandemic and with <coughs> HIV. TB, right? Because your risk of TB is just exponentially increased with HIV. It was hypertension. 
Hypertension was by and large the most common comorbidity. Why was it the most common comorbidity in HIV? Because it was just the most common comorbidity period. And HIV infected patients were not exempt. Surprise, right? <coughs> so I started thinking, well, okay, so because I, because I promised not to show any graphs, I didn't put this into slides, so you have to listen to my story. Yeah. Um, so I started thinking, well, okay, so, so we're treating people separately and picking and missing, um, missing these comorbidities that are actually more, um, more the rule than the exception, if you like, so not, not rare enough to not routinely screen for them. But beyond that, I started wondering, okay, so we have this huge hypertension and um, diabetes uh, prevalence burden. Firstly, I started wondering two things. Firstly, why are we not thinking about that in the context of people with a pre-existing chronic condition, be that infectious, because HIV really is a chronic infectious disease, and TB somewhat because of the period of time we have to be treated for. And secondly, why are we not, um, why are we not as a health system thinking more holistically about those pre-existing conditions? So this is not, we're still talking disease here, we're not talking health. So fast forward a little bit of time, I, at this point I was actually, I was infiltrating an immunology group as the only public health epidemiology person in an immunology group. You can imagine how happy everyone was in my, when it was my turn for journal club. <laughs> it's like, ah, oh, where are the cytokines? <laughs> um, so I moved at this point to the School of Public Health because I started thinking, well, I think I want to go back upstream and get a sense of what is, is this, con is, is this burden, these patterns, are they inevitable? What can we do? What is driving this, this transition that we see? How can I think beyond just, okay, one aspect is how can we treat them better and treat them more holistically? But also, these are preventable conditions. So what are we doing within the health care sector to prevent them. And I realized best case scenario, what we were doing is that the hypertension club, which is where people who have, you know, fairly stable hypertension, very loosely um, defined because of the burden, uh, you would have 10 minutes before each club where the health promoter would come in and like, everyone stand up, touch your toes, do a bit of this, here's a pyramid, etc., etc. And then we were happy that we've, we've, uh, we've done our bit of health promotion to improve their treatment. And there was something very weirdly complicit about, okay, I'm the doctor. I'm going to tell you a bunch of things to do that I know you can't do, but you're just going to listen and say yes. Mm -hmm. And as the patient, it's like, I'm going to listen to a bunch of things that I know I can't access, but I'm just going to pretend like I'm going to do them. Are we good? Okay, let's go. End of so so there, there was something really weird about that dance. So I know you, you need to eat better, you need to walk, and they go, yeah, yes, 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 doctor. I know it's not possible, because the second you walk out of the clinic, you look at the food system around you, the food environment around you, and there's nothing about it that may, was making the, a, a healthy choice any way easy. So anyway, so I moved into public health at that point. Um, maybe a couple of years before, actually, I had started, I did the public health registrar training in South Africa. I didn't mention that. Because I want to get a better sense of, that, of the health system and what's behind. Because I was doing some service provision, I didn't quite understand the health policy and what drove that. So when I moved to the um, School of Public Health, I set up this research group called REACH. Um, called the Research Initiative for Cities Health and Equity, because obviously the context I was working in is, is the city. And I started thinking, well, how can we look beyond the beyond just management and secondary prevention into addressing this epidemiological transition? So one part of the group 
was looking at this multimorbidity and trying to better understand and characterize this multimorbidity. And um, in order to inform and evaluate models for integrated care at the primary care level. The other aspect was looking at, um, and these, one is completed, and some papers out on that, and the other is ongoing, looking at HIV NCD prevention in the context of adolescence. So with ad in adolescence with, uh, with HIV, the chronic disease, what can be done, what research can, what information can inform strategies for NCD prevention. And one of the things I found is, you know, we're all very obsessed about teenagers having sex, for obvious reasons, but that is kind of the focus of our adolescence health. So it's sexual reproductive. But we had adolescents who are often invincible, as you might all remember from your adolescent days. Um, and so nowhere, generally not normally anywhere to be found near healthcare facilities. So you had help adolescents with a chronic condition, HIV, so we had access to them. And yet, the system was set up such that we would just continue seeing them for the HIV until we start seeing them for their hypertension as well. Does that not strike you as completely, why are we not talking to them? Why are we not, why are we not better understanding the ways in which we can address NCD prevention in this group of adolescents who we are a captive audience because they are coming in regularly. So that's another project that's ongoing. Um, don't have any results yet other, other, than, uh, other than the first bit, I can tell you the spoiler, looking through the folder review to get a sense of, before we actually start, started interviewing adolescents, to get a sense of how much um, NCD-related information is captured in their adolescent HIV folders, so related to BMI, pressure, eating, physical activity, smoking, alcohol, what do you reckon? Very little. Very little. <laughs> Incidentally, I should mention that the multimorbidity study I did, um, when we looked at um, the nine-month period of 14,000 people in Kailicha with, with a with one of those four conditions. One of the things that we found was that those, when you compare those on, on um, antiretroviral therapy, um, and I say that not HIV positive because obviously we, we were ca categorizing them based on their prescriptions and not on the diagnoses. But when you compare those with on antiretroviral therapy to those not, the rate of multimorbidity was particularly, was significantly higher in the 18, um, 18 to 25 age group in, age, in those on antiretroviral therapy. And this kind of supports some of the work that we know um, has been proposed around the early aging effects of HIV. Right. So it does seem like you're, the risk um, of some of those NCDs are higher or occur at an earlier age, HIV, and yet, uh, with the huge population of adolescents with HIV, we were not really bringing in NCD into the care. Okay. Oh, I'm going a lot slower than I intended. Speed through. Any questions on that? That was the first take home message. The second was. Um, was, is that NCD policy is more of an NCD health policy. And I say moving from NCDs to NCDDs, so moving from just thinking about NCDs, moving to NCD determinants. Um, so I'd really like to incorporate a stutter into your NCD lingo. Um, I will use the concept of the urban to, to speak to this. Okay. So this is something that this room is likely very familiar with. The notion of the iceberg, that what we see in the healthcare sector, it's just the tip of the iceberg in terms of um, the health profile. Below, below that lies a lot of the drivers of ill health from education, housing, uh, work, your food environment, etc. Of note, 
pretty much all of those fall outside our remit, right? So we know that a vast, um, overwhelming majority of factors that influence health, uh, that contribute to health, actually lie outside the health sector. And so when we start thinking about primary prevention, we start to understand actually why this is not a popular area of research because it's kind of complex in terms of, not complex actually, just messy because everyone's involved, right? This is actually where you need to be if you're thinking about primary prevention by and large or certainly be active in. And then you kind of longingly look back up to the iceberg and think maybe <laughs> reminisce about the simpler days. Um, this is my attempt. My PhD student loves the yeses, so I just keep bringing it up. Um, I started thinking about, well, how can we... So if you look in the background, this is when we think of a city, right? We often think about buildings or whatever. So how can we, as health professionals move from seeing the built to actually seeing the determinant of health. I started thinking about, well, how would, you, how would you break up the urban into exposures? What would that look like? And I started with sugar and salt, and it kind of sounded good, so I just decided I was going to stick to S's. So some of them are a little bit contrived, because I couldn't change after about four S's in. Um, so. On the right, you have some of the most common non-communicable diseases. And on the left, you have some of the uh, common um, urban exposures that we know. Certainly, um, recognizing that urban, rural urban is a continuum, and I don't want it to come across like it's a dichotomy, because in reality, we have this form of continuum. But characteristics of the urban that drive um, uh, that are driving some of these um, NCDs. So really moving from thinking about those NCDs to thinking about these NCDDs. And I realized that essentially in the work that I was moving into, I wanted to focus more on the NCDDs. So when you look at that, you start to wonder why. <laughs> because none of my training really then we need to start preaching the need to internalize that, not just within the NHS, not just within the healthcare sector. So I kind of, um, I, uh, I see myself as a healthcare professional because that was my training, and a health professional because I don't have a disease that I stand by, because most healthcare professionals do have that disease, right? Um, I, one of my best successes at the sermons, by the way, I gave a talk at the, uh, uh, the Royal Institute of British Architects, the room of architects and planners. And I totally, oh no, you're recording. Mm. <laughs> but I totally ambushed them because the beginning I was like, oh, who are the health professionals in the room? And by the time I was done, I'm like, who are the health professionals in the room? Like, we're all health professionals! <laughs> um, because one of, the, one of the challenges that I've come across in, 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 in my efforts, and I'll talk a little bit about when I talk about it, okay. um, one of the studies I looked at, I'm just going to say it now. Um, we looked at, uh, so we did a study looking at um, health and housing policy, right? Because um, it's one of the S's. Um, and one of the... One of the key barriers that we found to, because one of the great things about public health is, 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 is not rocket science, right? It's the most logical thing. It's like, we know what we need to do, you know? So th no one's going to say, well, I don't agree health is that important. You know, everyone's going to agree with you. Everyone's going to, to varying degrees, see the relevance potentially of what they do. But the governance of the NCDD world is not aligned and stream, you know, focused on health creation as an outcome. So without the internalizing of the I'm an urban planner and I'm a health professional, in what ways and what is what I'm doing impacting on health and what can I do about 
where we end up living in is this fallacy of trickle-down health. That we will just all do a good job at what we do and health will magically follow. We know that's not true. Actually, it is true for places that are, for groups of people and communities that are already healthier. The greens, right? In terms of access to those health promoting um, uh, environments. But we know that without, a cons without concerted effort and looking at, well, what is the health, what is the disease burden, what are the health needs of the population, what are the ways in which um, this particular urban exposure impacts uh, on that burden, and what are the ways in which what we do, um, what are the health impacts of what we do, and do they reach the people where the burden of disease lies? Without that follow through, what you end up with is, um, I don't know Cambridge that well, but what you end up with is bicycle lanes in the middle of the city where everyone's already biking anyway and really is not where the obesity or the diabetes is. But they've done some really good work. Bicycles are good, right? But without thinking consciously about the first take home around inequity, without thinking consciously about, what's the second take home? Uh, NCDD, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Without thinking about <laughs> NCDDs, without thinking about yourself as a health professional, irrespective of because you are in the NCDD world, what you end up with is missed opportunities to harness the environment for health creation. Why did I put this here? Oh, maybe it was just to give you some, a list of things because I said I wouldn't. Um, but just to check in, so in thinking about the, um, the global, some of the global targets for NCDs. <clears throat> Who knows anything about this policy document? Do you want to talk through it a little bit? <laughs> <laughs> Love language, like the, the relative reduction in prevalence of insufficient. <laughs> you got it right. Everyone's got, everyone's got what they need to do. <laughs> okay, so these are the nine major global targets that the WHO has set based on the um, action plan for NCDs by <coughs> 2025. Um, I have somewhere... Okay, somewhere I'll, I've got a slide that, that gives you some of, that, um, some of that breakdown of policy. I'll come back to that. But I started thinking, so, and this is just to demonstrate some of the work that um, I do and just to give you a, a glimmer into um, a headspace. If this is where ultimately we want to impact, so the health outcome, this is what, this is what we're about, right? Equitable improvement of health outcomes be that in the long term or the intermediate. We know that certain exposures uh, influence those health outcomes. And largely because we're talking about health, we think about health services. So I started thinking, well, if we think more around NCDDs and we think more around um, who a health professional is, then can we think differently about what a health service is? So we start with what we know, the healthcare service, right? Which is largely related to um, largely related to disease management, right? Secondary prevention, some exceptions obviously around the first thousand days around prophylaxis, palliation, etc. But by and large, the exposure to the healthcare um, uh, healthcare services determined by the dimensions of access. So these are the these are the five A's in dimensions of access. I like my number and letters, so five A's. It's not mine, but I, I, I wish it was. Um, availability, accommodation, affordability, access, flexibility. Right? So those are some of the exposures. The intermediate outcomes are things that we can easily measure in terms of, you know, the healthcare episodes, um, 
help when you're accessing healthcare, um, the, your admissions and the usual markers for your disease control and ultimately trying to reduce morbidity and mortality from those conditions. That's where we largely as healthcare professionals tend to stop. But if we think differently, can we think about habitation and planning as a health service that informs those kinds of exposures that relate to those intermediate outcomes and that significantly contribute to those long-term outcomes? Can we think about transport as a health service and think about some of the exposures that our thinking and transport policies um, relate, um, how, what kinds of exposures they result in, what kind of intermediate outcomes they influence, and what kind of long-term outcomes they contribute to. Can we think about waste, water sanitation, in a similar way? Can we think about food in a similar way? So then you start thinking, well, why do we only just talk about the bit at the end where largely we're talking about disease? Yeah. So I start asking in this context, um, can urban services and exposures be harnessed positively um, to influence health? So beyond understanding and better characterizing the ways in which they contribute to exposure and intermediate outcomes, a lot of which we somewhat know, um, either with evidence or anecdotally, but can they be harnessed? And if yes, how? And by who? So in addition to the health system side of my research group, we set up the systems for health. Right, so how can we harness those health services and start thinking in that way? I talked a little bit already about the health and housing project. Um, and the food, food systems is another one. Not, I'm going to rush through this because I talked a little bit about it. Other than to say that, um, and I'll say it again at the end, something like the WHO that you don't normally think about in the context of outside of the healthcare, they've characterized dimensions of housing that, just, that don't relate just to the built, the, the built structure, but also the psychosocial home environments, the physical characteristics of the neighborhood, and the social environment. So, that was just to mention that. I talked a bit about that. Let me talk about the second um, system for health. So this is, um, I came here, I came back June, July last year. Right, so I've been in Cambridge since then. And I'm within the <coughs> Global Diet and Activity Research Group at the MRC Unit. We have some NIHR funding to look in those different countries, working with those different partners at essentially meso and macro level approaches to NCD prevention through addressing diet and activity. So one of the studies that we've got um, gearing up to start is looking at, in the context of adolescence, and I've got my bean my bonnet about adolescence and what we can do. Um, we're looking at trying to better understand their lived experience in the context of their built and food environments, matching that with their individual um, level um, <coughs> knowledge, attitudes, and practices. Uh, we're looking at, because one of the interesting things about adolescence is that whatever you think they're doing, it's not that. Um, <laughs> and so, Looking at, looking at the, the way they navigate the urban environment through their eyes to better understand potential urban acupuncture points that would actually speak to those to that population group. So one of the cool things that we're planning, I don't know if I should say this on, on camera, but we're going to be looking at um, the journey to school. So having them on as citizen scientists, so they participate with the data collection to say, what are your what is your exposure what are your s's on the way to school what do you interact with and why and what do you miss and why and that might relate to retail in terms of what you can buy it might relate to advertising what you see what you hear etc 
and then um, use uh, a kind of quality sim, so geocode where that is to get a sense of what, what they, because this is where they spend most of their life really, you know, going to from school in terms of time frame. Looking a little bit at the school environment, so within and around the school, around the opportunities for um, uh, the food, the food environment and the built um, to the facility environment. And then, <coughs> and, then, uh, and then really using qualitative methodology to look at um, working with the adolescents to better understand how they process that uh, the data they collect, which is a combination of um, text and photo and GPS. So what we hope to do is to also better understand the ways that the ways of the environment that they expose to, so within their neighborhood and then on their journey to school, impact on the choices they make and their understanding. The ways that their peers and that interaction um, influence what they end up doing. And the idea and the hope is that we would use the, those results to co-design with the adolescents potential interventions aimed at, not at the individual, that aims at the environment at that meso level, um, be that in the neighborhood or the school or somewhere on the journey. And one of the exciting things about this, I think this might be one of the first times where I genuinely don't know what we're doing. <laughs> mm. I really don't know. Last point. <laughs> Who knows why I am suggesting evidence-based policy is a myth? Or who can suggest why? You can really know. Agree, disagree? Scandalize? Yeah. Scandalize? Yeah. Okay, cool. <laughs> yes, I can go. Um, okay, let's take a step back into policy. <laughs> Has anyone seen that before? So this is a um, policy triangle that is, was developed by um, Lucy Gilson. I know her first name because I worked with her, and somebody, Walt, because I don't know her, um, uh, who were public health, um, uh, health systems uh, researchers. <clears throat> To think about when you so, so it was largely developed in the context of health policy. Think about what is it you want to understand the health policy environment. What are the key components of what you look at? So they have characterized this into the context, the content of the policy, the process through which the policy was developed, because that tells you a lot about what will work and what won't work. And right in the middle of that. Um, of that triangle are the actors. And what I like about this, this um, and you realize how easy it is to not do one of those when you're thinking about trying to understand the policy. Because right? we normally just go to content. But who was involved in the setup of the, of the policy? Who was, what was the, what was the pivotal, pivotal moment? Who, who said something and everyone said, yeah, yeah, we should do that, that sounds good. What was the context at the time? What made it come up and, uh, and, and make it um, adopted? And what was that process? So that's something that I thought it'd be useful for you to know. This is something that's been around for a long time in health policy research. I want to talk um, about more broadly around advice and evidence advice. So this, um, this diagram, when it's done, was um, adapted from um, uh, a guy called uh, Professor Peter Gluckman, um, who was the chief, who was the chief scientific advisor to the Prime Minister of New Zealand, and established the International Network of Government Science Advice, recognizing that there was a need to pull together some of the expertise, that, whether it's from chief advisors to right through to the researcher, to better understand the different mechanisms through, we, through which 
um, evidence is fed into policy. And one of the key things I learned from going on the training workshop with them a few years ago was how much I just assumed that, you know, I can't understand why you wouldn't do what we've just found because we've just done some really awesome research that is really relevant. I'm showing you the results. I mean, what more can I do? And I'm starting to understand the limitations of that approach, which as I say out loud, perhaps might be obvious, but we still all do this. So we think science feeds into policy. But in reality, the best you can hope for is evidence-informed policy. I can almost confidently say no policy is based on evidence. Right? Hopefully, you have some evidence going in and informing the policy. And the job of the policymaker is to consider that alongside the context, the culture, the history, other policies, in the city, other policies in the region, other policies in the country, and to make those decisions around trade-offs. That is the job of the policymaker. But we think, no, but the science has told you exactly what to do. Why don't you just do that? We also forget the role of society, except for around elections and referenda, <laughs> when we <laughs> wish we could forget. Um, <laughs> it took an hour before that came up. Um, <laughs> but given that policymakers are largely elected, the society actually plays a huge role. So one of the um, great stories that he tells, which I'm just going to plagiarize, um, is he talks about one of the first tests that he came across was um, there, were, there was discussions around um, whether folic acid, whether folic, um, all food should be enriched uh, with folic acid. And there was huge outcry, you know, Frankenstein food, blah, blah, and all of that. And the usual um, intellectual kind of response to that is to go, oh, come on, it's so obvious, why would you not just, you know, think about spina bifida, think about the risk, the benefits, it's just a no-brainer. Um, and at the time, I don't know what, this is a few years ago, I don't know where it ended up, because uh, New Zealand's kind of rocks right now, so it's like, anyway, let's not get into politics. Um, um, at the time, the policymaker decided not to go with it. And so the media was like, well, how do you feel about being ignored as your first thing? as your first, your first task. And he says, well, the policymaker made the right decision for the policymaker. Because there was a lot of input from society into the policy. But the people rolling their eyes and going, mm, we're doing very little to feed into that. And so that was the right decision for the policymaker in the context of their job description. We have a responsibility to understand the policy landscape, to understand the ways in which what we know, whether it's from a practice or from our research, can feed into policy and to advocate where it matters. Because without that, they make, they make the calculated decision that might seem obvious to us. We also forget the science and society link, right? We forget that in addition to, it's not just Gwyneth Paltrow that can tell the society uh, the latest health advice. Right? What, are, what are we doing to indirectly influence policy about that? So that was, that was the myth of evidence-based policy. So very lastly, the last um, bit I'll touch on is around that global, thinking about the global context. So these are, of course, the SDGs. 
privilege for everyone. Mm -hmm. yeah, so um, I like this ad adaptation, firstly because it puts health in the middle and you know what's not to love. Um, but secondly, because it essentially goes through the different um, targets. Oh my goodness, I didn't um, credit that. I think I've got it in the last slide. Um, <coughs> it goes through all the different SDGs and the targets, identifies ways in which those NCDDs speak to the health target. I.e. when we talk about SDG 3 as the health target, what else is a health target in the SDGs? Again, it's, it's just changing the way we think about health and about our remit, if we really are to, um, to improve health. This is the um, slide that I spoke about earlier. This gives you a sense of not really speaking to it other than just to let you know it's there, that there is a wealth of global level MCD policies so this is just between 2013 and two last year. Um, the, some of the data that I showed initially around us, the targets come from the Global Action Plan for Prevention of, of and Control of NCDs. This gives you a sense of some of the policy landscape. What I haven't juxtaposed on this is some of the policy processes that are in place or a little bit around the um, the UN High Level Political Declaration, the UN Task Force for NCDs, and actually last year was the second time that the UN General Assembly, not the WHO, the UN General Assembly, um, had a health issue on the agenda and it was NCDs. So the only other time that's happened is for HIV. So that gives you a sense of how, how high up on the general agenda, so this is not a health meeting, um, NCDs are including mental health, which is quite awesome, because um, that's often neglected. So I'd really encourage you to appraise yourself with some of these, some of these processes, but also ask yourself, how are these being translated into the national, your national landscape? Do you know what the East of England policy is on, on any of this, how they've translated some of this. So there are some best buys around the global action plan. Do you know what the, if the city of Cambridge has anything on this? That's where you need to start, right? So a lot of these global things are set the agenda, but they are, have to be implemented nationally and sub-nationally. So if you don't know how, we all, we all operate on a deficit um, mentality, right? Because we see the burden of disease. And like, no one's doing anything up, really, are you sure? Are you sure before you say that? Because you just ask your mate, and they also didn't know, right? And sometimes you'd be surprised at, when we were looking at the health and housing um, policy research, and we were looking at essentially opportunities opportunities for intersexual collaboration. So are there any policies that exist already that we can already, outside of the health sector, that are already kind of <coughs> dancing around health that could be the where to go? Because there's no need to start from the beginning and invent something from scratch when there's a low hanging fruit. And one of the things I was really surprised by, because obviously I expect this to be nothing, because it's all siloed and it's all vertical and oh, thank God I'm here. Yeah. Um, actually, what I found was that there was quite a lot of policy documents and strategic um, plans around wanting to integrate the different sectors. We can talk about implementation and the deficits of that, and I think that's, that was definitely an issue. But if I didn't actually have it as one of the objectives, I think I would have just assumed that there was none and started from there. <laughs> But what about the NCDD policies? This is that where it starts getting, oh my goodness, that's just where do you stop? Because there is a wealth of global level policies that relate to NCDs 
but they exist outside of the health sector. That don't, you will not find on the WHO website. Right. Does anyone know about the new urban agenda? Right. So this is a Habitat 3. There's been a meeting every the decades or so. And there was most recently in 2016 in Quito. And so WHO did some work around looking at how do we put health into that new urban agenda. Because we're talking about the exposures um, that drive the burden of we see. Does anyone know that, um, oh yes, that's it. This, um, that circular document um, around the SDGs and the way of interaction came from this. This is a really great um, uh, publication I'd recommend to look at different, um, the ways that different SDGs interact and some of, the, some of the gaps in terms of the knowledge that we, it was not just health and, but there's some health questions there. UN Habitat is getting into health, right? Obviously, because it's on habitation. So this is, was just um, published last year. So it gets case studies around um, incorporating health into urban and territorial planning. And later this year, there will be a look out for it, an urban, a UN Habitat Health and Urban Planning Guide. So this looks at different ways, and this is very relevant to NCD. So would you think to look for NCD policies on the UN Habitat website? The WHO just released, this has been almost a decade in the making, uh, Housing and Health Guidelines um, in November last year to summarize some of the evidence on the different ways in which um, housing, using all those different dimensions of housing I mentioned earlier, different ways that they impact on health, both infectious and non-communicable. And actually, I didn't put that, that there, but you absolutely have to look at, I get very excited about this awesome reading, um, you also have to look at the um, urban health, the Global Urban Health Report. So that was a, a joint report between WHO and UN Habitat. There's two. Hidden Cities and the Global Urban Health Report. So if you're thinking about NCDs in this way and you're trying to think about, well, in this NCDD world, because we are so focused on the health professionals, care professionals, correction, um, in, uh, in our sector and the kinds of data that we access and the kind of literature that we access, this is a good place to start. I think that's the end. Because this looks at, um, get a sense of the opportunities to contribute, to really, to address that valley of death. Because if you don't know, if you don't know what's going on, you don't know how to, what your place and what your role is and what you can do. So those are the take home messages, just to recap. Only one person left. Hmm. Um, uh, averages, beware, inequity, huge. Think about NCDs beyond health policy. Think about health professionals beyond health care. And lastly, know your policy landscape and think very broadly when you do that. Because really, if we're going to address NCD, the NCD burden in many, um, at the population level, the population level primary preventions are going to be our best bet in the long term because we're unlikely to be able to treat ourselves out of this epidemic. So I'll end there by thanking um, this, by the way, I know this looks like something a professional drew, but would you believe I did it? <laughs> oh, I know. Um, this is my way of thinking about NCDDs, like in the city, pushing you off the cliff, and we're just healthcare waiting to save you from drowning in the ambulance. But how can we reverse that and think about the ways that the city and the environment can not just push us off, but actually help promote health. And that is um, definitely not EU level in emissions of the ambulance driving off, because we're reducing the need and the demand for health care. I'll stop there.